All right, thank you very much for joining the Institute of Politics at Florida State University this evening for our talk, Rising to the Challenge of Covering Politics in the Current Political Environment. I'm Dina Rollinger. I am a professor of sociology and one of the directors of research for the Institute of Politics. I am very pleased to introduce two panelists this evening. Our first is Jill Zuckman, who is standing in for Hillary, who has fallen ill. Thankfully, it's not COVID, but I'm very pleased that she was able to send her colleague Jill for us this evening. And Jill is a partner at SKDK Knickerbocker and specializes in public affairs and crisis communications at this firm. Before joining SKDK, Jill was an award-winning politician, an award-winning, sorry, political correspondent, and served as an assistant Secretary and Director of Public Affairs for Transportation Secretary Ray LaHood. At the U.S. Department of Transportation, Jill was responsible for developing the nationally acclaimed campaign against distracted driving, among many other things. And prior to this service, Jill worked as a national political correspondent for both the Chicago Tribune and before that, the Boston Globe. So thank you for being with us, Jill. Thanks Our for having me. Panelist is Christian Denny Todd, and she is a co-founder of Maverick Strategies and Mail, which is a messaging and voter contact firm. The firm has represented several well-known companies and foundations such as United Way and VotesForVets.org, as well as numerous pol politicians, among Florida's own Senator Bob Graham, Amy mm -hmm. And this guy, a senator that's been getting a lot of attention on the internet for his his mittens. I think his name's Bernie Sanders. Yeah. So before starting her, her own company, Christian served as the first ever public relations director for the Atlantic Media Group, which is a Washington-based publisher that owns lots of outlets, including the Atlantic Monthly. And I have to brag that Christian is an FSU graduate. Yeah. So Gold Nobles, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so as you know, the topic of tonight's conversation is the challenge of covering politics in the current political environment. And let's face it, this is critically important. Yes. While Americans clearly do not agree on how we should understand the events of January 6, 2021, this moment underscored the reality that our complex media system isn't always living up to its democratic ideal. So we, we may have a marketplace of ideas, but the, dish, the issues of the day are not always respectfully debated among those who are holding various points of view. So more often than not, news outlets and social media platforms provide a megaphone for amplifying the political differences among us. So what are we to do? Well, conversations like this are an important first step and while we can't solve all of our society's media ills in a mere 60 minutes, our goal for this evening is to outline some of the challenges that we face when we're covering politics in a polarized era, and then really dig in and start to discuss some of the ways that mass media might help promote civil discourse. So here's the structure for this evening. So we'll have some introductory remarks from each of our panelists. And then I have some questions that I'll be asking, and then we'll, we'll open the floor to question and answers. If you're new to Zoom, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A bubble. You can put in a question any time that you would like, and we will try to get to it at the end of the program. So again, just to throw it in when something comes to your head, and we'll try to get to that And I imagine about the last 15 or so minutes. So I am pleased again to welcome our panelists, and I'm gonna turn it over to you first, Jill. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's nice to be here, and I wish I could say it's great to see everybody, but they can't really see anyone. Um, so this is a great topic and an important one, I think, for everyone to be reflecting on after you know, following this last four turbulent years. Um, I left journalism in early 2009. Uh, Twitter was really not the thing then that it is today. Um, back then, I had so I had just finished covering the 2008 presidential election. I was working for the Chicago Tribune, our hometown senator Barack Obama, 
ran against John McCain. And back then in 2008, I was on uh, the radio five mornings a week at 6.30 a.m. talking about politics. I was on cable television multiple times a week talking about the latest with presidential campaign. I was blogging for the Tribune's blog and then I was writing my news stories uh, every day. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was really operating on every platform there was that we knew about that people were communicating on those days. Um, and back then everybody would decry the 24 hour news cycle. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, the 24 hour news cycle. Well, you know, we didn't have Twitter. I don't know what I would have done if I had to be tweeting on top of all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, first of all, you, it's really tough to be thoughtful on Twitter. Um, today, you have reporters who are actually reporting in real time what they're finding out on Twitter, and then they kind of put it all in their story at the end of the day. I mean, I don't know how many of you do this, but I tend to read the New York Times and the Washington Post at night before I go to bed. And then I'm not reading them in the morning because there's nothing new in the morning, really. Um, you know, I'm checking to see what happened overnight in other parts of the world. Um, uh, you know, uh, one story I'll just share with you from 2008. Uh, my claim to fame that cycle was that I broke the news story that John McCain had picked Sarah Palin to be his running mate. And I was out there by myself for a couple of hours. It was a mm -hmm. couple of hours before the McCain campaign finally put the news out and everybody could follow me. It was the most uncomfortable feeling I think I've ever been in. Uh, my friend Jake Tapper emailed me and said, how sure are you? And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, I sure hope I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everybody was trying to get it. And I, I, it, was, it was uncomfortable. Can you imagine a story like that today, sitting out there for two hours and not getting confirmed on Twitter by 10,000 other people immediately? I mean, that's sort of the bookend from, you know, where I think we've gone. And, you know, unfortunately, what Twitter has done is not just sped things up, but it's infused everything with massive amounts of opinion. So imagine that you're the politician and every time, or the campaign, every time you say something, you've got a stadium full of people booing at you. Mm -hmm. That's Twitter kind of, and it just really, it's, it's uncomfortable and it's, it's tough. So anyway, I look forward to this mm -hmm. conversation and I hope that's a good way of uh, kind of framing some of what we're gonna talk about. Yeah, great, thank you. Please, Christian. Um, hi everyone. So I'm so excited to be here. I am a graduate at FSU, 1992. Uh, feels like yesterday. <laughs> Still feels like yesterday. Um, but that's another subject. Um, but uh, you know, I want to say a few things about kind of piggyback on what Jill said. Which, by the way, she and I have a history. Back in 2004, when I was working for 2003. 2003, right? 2002, 2000, 2003, when I was working for Bob Graham in Iowa, I think Jill covered us um, as a journalist. I was a flack. I was a press flack. Um, all the politicians have them. And uh, I got to say, just listening to Jill speak now, gosh, things have changed. I mean, so drastically. Um, Jill mentioned breaking a story um, and how people, journalists now, do that on Twitter. That's Back when I did this kind of work, there was no Twitter, and we did the old press release. I mean, that whole thing, the press release, um, I, I do know that they're still used today, but we, you know, so often you see more and more people break news on Twitter, which is still foreign to me, because there's no context, like Jill just said. There's not enough context. There's not enough space for that. Um, 
And I, you know, I guess I'm old enough where, you know, when I worked on the Hill and we would have press conferences and there would be a lot of explanation. And anyway, that's kind of gone away. And I think that's part of the issue. Um, you know, one of the things that I'd like to also say in regards uh, to what Jill said about social media, I totally agree, but also cable news. Cable news, and we can talk about what I mean by that, has drastically changed the conversation in a way that's almost hard to articulate. Um, and when we talk about cable news, we also have to talk about that these are capital enterprises. They're there to make money. And so we, again, that's, that's all part of it, but this is a relatively new phenomenon. And, and Jill, I, I hope you agree with me, but I say within the last 10 years that we've seen this pivot to not, where cable news is not about reporting the news. And again, we can have a conversation about what that means, the news, but, they just parrot what their supporters or their viewers want to hear. So is that still news? Do you, do these pe are these people allowed to call themselves journalists? I don't know. I mean, I guess that's part of the conversation. Yeah. yeah, that's a great segue into the first questions because part of it involves Twitter and the diversity of our offerings that we have available, right? So we have a, a lot of outlets or at least a lot of news outlets that are providing views on the on the issues of the day. What do you think this means for political news coverage that Americans consume? Well, I'm gonna let Jill take that first because Jill's <laughs> the journal. Well, she's the journalist, and um, I think it's. I don't. It's it's an interesting question how real journalists approach this, given the landscape. But they're not totally separate, right? So there's a journalist that's covering it, but then you're still putting out messages. So you also have to figure out how how yeah. do you navigate a really complicated landscape. But go ahead and jump in, and then we'll see. Well, yeah. look, right now it just feels like everything is a lot less thoughtful than it was. You know, it's it's so sped up. And it's so geared to breaking news, breaking news, breaking news, not what does this mean? What's the analysis? I mean, like analysis is sort of out the window. It's just people shouting on Twitter, literally, um, and, and on cable. I mean, you know, uh, the, one of the problems with cable, I think, is that you have to choose a side like yeah. choose which side you want to be on depending on which cable network you're going to go on. And so people are, they're choosing to get their news from where they agree, you know, where they're agreeing. So we've gotten even more separated and, and people are getting their views reinforced all day long. And it's just, so hard for uh, a real conversation about difficult issues. I mean, my God, COVID, what is more challenging? That is the issue of our time. And it's, you know, the, why, can't we, why can't we have a thoughtful discussion about how to tackle it? Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you think, Christian? Well, it's just, I mean, you know, I agree and I think, I, it's the misinformation. Okay, and again, I'm coming from a place regard with from the cable news aspect. The people at some point, and I want to say it was somewhere around 2010, 2011. They there was a there was this um, desire to kind of gravitate to where to just you know racking up viewers and making sure you had the numbers and that kind of thing. And what, unfortunately, what that, what that, uh, you know, and, 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 okay, let me back up a minute, layer on the whole social media aspect of it, where people are in their silos. This is a, this is a, um, 
a phrase we use in the business. People go into their silos, they go into the echo chamber where they're only hearing um, opinions that agree that they agree with. Um, that's human nature, so that's not necessarily bad. But there, then what happened was is that it became monetized. So then there was no um, there was no alternative. There was no there was no motivation to kind of pull yourself out of that. Um, and then you kind of layer on a hyper politicized environment brought on by X, Y, and Z, whatever, you know, there's many, many answers to that. And it just became hardcore. Uh, I will say this, I think right now, it feels very uh, dire. It feels like a, uh, a fundamental problem uh, that I don't see a good, um, you know, obvious answer to. And I'm not, you know, again, we can sit here and talk about, okay, Fox News or MSNBC, whichever, which, whatever side of the spectrum you're on, um, how, how do they deal with that? But right now they're making money, they've got their viewers, and where does journalism, you know, fit in? And, and to me, just to add on to that, to me though, the greater, I mean, I, I don't enjoy all the shouting on Twitter, shouting on cable stuff. It's, you know, it's exhausting and it feels like we're not getting anywhere. Mm -hmm. But what concerns me even more is the disinformation that is being put out through the social networks. It's being put out through Fox News. Um, one of the projects I work on is to track some of that disinformation. Um, and it is, um, it's a real thing. I mean, all those attempts to twist the, what was going on in Ukraine uh, related to uh, then Vice President Biden, um, you know, just terrible, terrible stuff. I mean, that one sort of flopped. But still, they're, they're out there plugging away. There are groups every day trying to put terrible things um, out there to, and brainwashing people, mm -hmm. I think, is the only way of, of explaining it. Mm -hmm. I mean, disinformation is definitely, that's like almost a whole other webinar we would have to have. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Yeah, but I want to pull on one thread just because you, you you caught my interest, both of you, in something that you were indicating. I want to make sure I'm understanding it correctly. So one of the things that sounded like you were saying is in some ways cable has become more like our social, it's like Twitter, right? It's more like social media. Absolutely. Where it's more, everything's about um, amplifying and just attracting the eyeballs as opposed to, to discourse. And it also sounded like, Jill, maybe you were suggesting so if you choose MSNBC and you go on CNN, MSNBC, then Fox News is off the table. That's not a place that you're welcome anymore. Is that That's right? I mean, I think there are very few people who are flipping back and forth from Fox, oh, yeah. MSNBC to CNN. I mean, I, I think people who watch Fox are, you know, consider themselves conservatives or consider themselves supporters of Donald Trump. And that's where they're comfortable being. Uh, and if they're not comfortable there, then they want to go even further right to to the uh, One America Network. Right. Um, and I think liberals are hanging out on MSNBC and CNN. And mm -hmm. and the other thing is, you've got you know on cable, there's like maybe three stories a day, two or three stories a day, and it's just the same ones over and over again. You can't. You, know, you do not have a diversity of, you know, content, mm -hmm. let alone and, opinion. And I want to say this, by the way, because I, I, I think it's important here. As I sit here and criticize it, as I sit here and say there's problems, if I was advising a candidate right now, I say you need to go on MSNBC. You need to go on Twitter. You need to do that. You need to be out there. You need to join the conversation. So, again, I'm not, it's, it's a... It's a tough nut. And although I actually, I absolutely um, recognize the challenges and I think there's problems that need to be fixed. Um, I'd be the first one to say, okay, if you're running for Senate or if you're you know, president, you need to be, you need to be heard by, um, you know, progressives or, you know, so 
and you need to go on MSNBC to do that. So I, you know, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough issue. And it seems like then a sort of related issue um, that fits in with our series is this notion of incivility. So there's very few stories. You have cable outlets mirroring more and more uh, the social media platforms. And so is this also contributing to this incivility, not even just disinformation, but the name calling, the, the high drama and the partisanship? Well, yes, and absolutely. And, you know, you see it on Capitol Hill most dramatically, where you've got two parties that conceivably have to work together for the for the greater good to get things done. And over the years, it's been harder and harder and harder. And believe me, I wrote those stories about partisanship for years. Uh, my old boss, Ray LaHood, uh, before he became Secretary of Transportation, mm -hmm. he was a Republican member of Congress mm -hmm. from Peoria. He came in with the class of 94 when uh, Newt Gingrich became speaker and Republicans took the majority for the first time in a million years. And he was really committed to bipartisanship, to civility. He used to help uh, organize a, an annual retreat for members of Congress and their families that was like the, the bipartisan retreat. It eventually kind of withered and died. People didn't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And then at another point, he and uh, Rahm Emanuel, who is his best friend, uh, one night they got a room at the Monocle, which is a Capitol Hill restaurant, and they each invited uh, a half dozen, you know, members of their own party to come have dinner and talk. And that was the first of a series of dinners. And it, and what grew out of it were attempts to work together and find common ground. Where can we work together? I just, I don't know that that is happening much on Capitol Hill these days. And obviously we also saw, you know, the, the end result of all of this um, acrimony on January 6th. It's, um, you know, it's a rough, rough neighborhood there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm old enough to, I remember, and Jill can, Jill can identify this. I remember when bipartisanship was a good thing. Like, I can work across the aisle. I'm, I'm the guy that, you know, when you were running for office, right? That was something that you like shouted from the rooftops because you're like, I can do that. I can, I can reach across the aisle and I can, there is no reward for that anymore on either side. And by the way, we've seen the last several years, the, the gridlock that you find in Congress and it's all because of that. The word that is, we use in the business is called tribalism. And tribalism is, and again, that's a, that's a whole other thing, but one of the things about tribalism is that it's not, you're not allowed to be different. You're just, it's just bad, it's wrong. So it's not just different, it's just bad. And so, and I, and again, without, you know, launching into something else, I think that fundamentally is about social media because you do kind of, you know, you kind of go into these silos where you're only hearing people that are like-minded and you're, you don't know, you know, different opinions become foreign to you or just unacceptable. And that is, like I said, in politics, that is a very recent, you know, all, you know, all intents and purposes, it's, it's pretty recent uh, phenomenon. And this is something you might be able to uh, shed light on is uh, just this whole idea of context collapse. So for example, you know, one maybe perhaps one of the reasons that we don't have politicians talking about working together anymore is because it can be captured and shared really easily. Yeah. So if you have all these people, uh, if, if anyone can observe what you're doing at any given point in time and it's shared and it become a news story, then that perhaps can be a disincentive to some of the kinds of cooperation that you're talking about. I don't know, what, what do you all see when you're, when you're doing your work? Well, you know, it's, well, I'm gonna speak about, um, so my husband is a journalist himself. He's a, he's a DC based political journalist. And he had this great story. This was probably a year ago or so. And he was asked to, um, he, 
he was gonna have there he was gonna meet a senator john thune from south dakota he's gonna meet him at a restaurant on capitol hill to talk uh off record you know just the normal the usual stuff and so then he got a call from him leading up to the meeting and said you know what i can't be seen in public with you this is a true story he said i can't be seen in public with you because i'll get raked over the coals for just meeting with a journalist that is considered you know bad or anti or you know however you want to and so they so so my husband went to his office instead i mean not a big deal but that was to me i, I was just like seriously i mean but to your point he was afraid he was going to be seen and then somebody would tweet it out and then, you know, he'd have to defend himself and become a thing that he just didn't want to deal with. And so I totally agree with that premise. I, I don't know what to deal. I don't know how to fix it. Um, because, I mean, I, part of me is like, we have to kind of let this thing run its course so we can rein it back in. But that might be a cop out. I'll be honest. So I, you know, I completely agree with that. And as a reporter, I always believed that it was to, to cultivate sources. I, my tool, the tool in my tool belt was to break bread with people. You know, you, you meet them over a meal, you have a chance to get to know them as a human being, they got a chance to know you and to develop a certain amount of trust. It was very, very important. And I just, I, I thought, uh, you know, Christian, uh, Senator Portman announced yesterday mm -hmm. that he's not going to run for re-election. I thought that was a devastating sign. Mm -hmm. It was a sign that, you know, nobody is serious about legislating in Washington, about doing the work of government, and he doesn't want to do this anymore. Right. I mean, there, he's a serious guy. He's a serious guy. And you know, the, the three Republicans that are, are retiring, Portman, Toomey, and Burr, are very moderate guys. And they're just, they're throwing their hands up because they're like, I can't get anything done. And I'm not the guy to live on Twitter. I'm not the guy to throw out the provocative statements about the other side. I'm not, you know, if I may, Ted Cruz, I'm just not gonna do that. So he basically said in his statement, I, there's no place for me here anymore. And that's just sad. And then, and I, again, I'm not sure what to do about it. Now, we're talking a lot about Republicans, but there's folks on the left that do this too. Um, everybody's heard of AOC. Okay. She does this too. So, I mean, there's, you know, both sides have these issues, no doubt. Let's talk about maybe some potential solutions, even if we don't have any solid ones, but it seems like we've talked about three different areas. So the practices of journalists that contribute to incivility, this profit-making profit -making function of media that contributes, and then politicians themselves that are looking to be reelected and are doing so by making sure they have a loyal following. Well, let's start with the journalists. Um, maybe Jill, start us off since you have some journalistic background. What do you think are some of the practices that might change that could potentially help media contribute to a more civil climate? Well, you know, there's different, different kinds of media. And so you have to kind of start there. Uh, if I were running the Washington Post, I think I would tell all my journalists, all my reporters to stop tweeting. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I can't tell you the number of friends I've seen get in trouble on Twitter because they go over that line from reporting to saying something outrageous and very opinionated, and then you lose all credibility. So uh, to me, I think that would be a really important thing. That doesn't mean they can't monitor Twitter or they can't you know, keep, keep, see what people are saying there. But um, when somebody who is supposed to be down the middle and reporting the news and bringing you know, history and perspective and analysis to it, um, weighing in on your reporting every day, 12 times a day, I think that's a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. 
And I'll say, and again, you know, I, and I know that this is what journalists strive to do every day, every minute of every day, is just make sure you're reporting spot on. And if that means taking a moment before you tweet it out <laughs> or, you know, run with the, you know, cause now, you know, again, I'm old enough where you couldn't throw something on the internet, you know, in two, you know, two minutes. Um, you could post a story, you know, it just didn't work that way. You know, again, I'm old enough to where, you know, above the fold on the front page was a big deal, right? <laughs> That's a long time ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. um, so, but I, the accuracy has got to be there. And I, and I, and I, and I, I sympathize with journalists because there's this race to get it first. And, mm -hmm. and so I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying that it's important to get it right. And over the years, I've noticed that very reputable uh, news outlets, they go, they've gone to this, well, sources say, or we've heard, not, not we've heard, they would never say that, but there's this, that, and back in the day when I was doing, when I was a flat, when I was, you know, in the, you know, in the meat of it, no, nobody, you know what I mean? They, they, they just, it wouldn't be about, you know, sources say, or were, or, you know, reports say, they would source their own story. They would chase it down and, and they would verify it. And I think, again, I'm not saying that it's easy. That's, you gotta kind of go back to the fundamentals. Yeah, and, and the other thing about that is if you're a journalist and you're about to break a really sensitive story, especially something that could alter a presidential race, mm -hmm. let alone a Senate race or a House race or a governor's race, it would go through a lot of vetting. You know, you have your editor, the political editor, then, you know, the editor of the paper would mm -hmm. probably look at it, the managing editor. Then of course there's the copy desk mm -hmm. and those people are saints. You know, they fix all, all kinds of things in your stories. It's really important to go through that process. A lot of papers have gotten rid of their copy desks and I think in this rush to get things out, there isn't the, you know, the consideration and the judgment that should go into some of the stuff. It's just all, it's like everybody's out there with their kimono open at mm -hmm. all times. Mm -hmm. And I, <laughs> if I may, one more, one more thing about this and then we'll move on, but if I may. So there was this, there's, I'll give you an example. So back to the Trump administration, again, I'm, 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 I'm giving you a little peek behind the curtain here at my house. And again, I, my husband's a journalist and his news organization had a tip. They had a source tell them that, and this again was during the Trump administration that uh, uh, Justice Gorsuch was, had been reprimanded or censured or however you wanna say it by Chief Justice Roberts for coordinating with the White House now, you never heard about that. Why? Because they couldn't get a second source on it. So they didn't go with it. Right. Right. Oh, that's so old fashioned of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, so this, what you're talking about really gets at sort of this crux of this problem, right? Where on the one hand, you have the profits. So you have this 24 hours news cycle, you have all these competitors, everyone wants to break the news first. So you've got that portion, but then you have that democratic promise of mass media. Right, where they're uh, not only can they get information out to you quickly and hopefully correct information, but that the citizen citizenry can respond, that they have a, a participation component with media. So there's the feedback loop that you don't always get otherwise. So, so what are some of these solutions that we can think of? Is, you know, we periodically hear, well, we need to do more of a BBC uh, version. We need to have a US equivalent of that. Yeah more kind of realistic ways. I don't see us establishing something or, you know, pumping more money into public or public broadcasting system in the near future. Yeah. What, yeah, what do you think? That's an interesting thing. And, and you know, and I hear that and I, and yeah, a lot uh, about, you know, some sort of state, uh, I hesitate to use that, right? State sponsored news outlet. Um, it's, it, I, that idea in and of itself is never going to happen. Uh, 
not 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 anytime soon um i think it's such a problem because we are so um protective of our first amendment rights and then we are we don't like to muzzle people at all and and that's a, and that's fundamental, right? I mean, that comes with the territory. So it's a tough thing. Um, I guess I'm gonna put the onus on the news organizations. They, they're they gonna have, and again, if you wanna call Fox News or MSNBC a news organization, then they have to kind of police themselves. That's, that's tough because, you know, who's gonna be the cop, right? Um, now, what we're seeing with the social, with the tech people is that they're gonna, they're, it's gonna start. They're gonna start, you know, they're gonna start getting regulated. By the way, they've been begging to be regulated for the last, you know, five, six, seven years. And so now they will be. I don't know what that looks like, but uh, you've seen a lot of pressure being put on them. Uh, I don't really know how to deal with the cable net. You know? I, the, the thing that just, kills me it, on social media is the, the attitude by Facebook in particular that anything goes. We're not, you know, we're not, who are we to say what's true or false? Sure, let's have Holocaust denialism. They've gone back, you know, they've been all over the map on that particular issue, which is so outrageous. Um, you know, and of course, their algorithms mm -hmm. and the fact that we're seeing crap on Facebook from so called news sites that are nothing more than propaganda sites. Mm -hmm. You know, they're favoring those things instead of favoring uh, mainstream news organizations that at least have some standards. Great. And it's interesting because then we can bring the tech companies back in because right here again, we have um, we have platforms that are disseminating news, but again, they're interested in making a profit. So the algorithms are driven to keep our eyeballs glued to whatever size screen we currently be pay are paying attention to. And it does, it sort of really makes us think through where do we, how do we balance this? What do you think about how should tech companies make sure that they're not violating um, people's free speech, but also making sure that they're not promoting violence, for instance. Well, so I will say I felt really heartened by Twitter cracking down on Trump and his cronies and labeling their tweets when they were false and their decision to finally boot him off. Um, I, I really did feel good about that. But I have to say for, for Facebook in particular, I, I think their moves have been too little, too late. They have followed, they haven't led. And as Christian says, you know, they're gonna get regulated and it's, ha it's gonna happen. It has to happen. It has it's to happen. It's just been crazy out there. Mm -hmm. Well, and maybe regulation would help everyone because what you've also said is both of you've indicated is, you know, everyone's kind of in this impossible situation. Mm -hmm. Outlets want to make money. Um, you know, journalists are trying to stand out so that they can keep their jobs and be promoted. And politicians are trying to figure out how do you effectively navigate this environment. So maybe it is the idea of can they come up with some reasonable regulations for that includes tech mm -hmm. to help make things more balanced where they're actually providing forms where people are having conversations, even if they don't agree with each other, or at least having different points of view. That they're well, I want to just challenge this idea that they have to provide misinformation or yeah. craziness to make money. Facebook is is a money printing machine. Just from people wanting to go on and share their kids or their pets mm -hmm. photos with their friends. I mean, like that by itself, I think, is fueling their yeah. enterprise. They don't have to allow the stuff they're allowing on there that's my opinion yeah and i and to jill's point i think you're right i mean i think it almost is a little bit too late uh for that now 
here's the other thing. I have a 16 year old daughter. I have a 13 year old son, and I know, they're not interested in Facebook. Um, they wouldn't be caught dead on Facebook. So my point is that you know we we're starting to see a bit of a turnover. Not it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen next year. But we're gonna you know so. But for Facebook, it may be too late. But um, I will say this about politicians or you know folks who use the platforms and kind of the the dilemma they find themselves in because you know and and Jill knows this really well in, in politics perception is reality it doesn't matter sometimes what the facts are it's what people think are the facts and so that's the trap that they that these politicians find themselves in now could they rise above it absolutely could they all those all those things but sometimes that's not the reality that we're dealing with here so uh, you know it's 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 a tough thing to navigate for these politicians i'm not going to i'm not going to sh- you know and we could you know at any given time you could you could say well they don't have the you know they don't have the integrity they don't have the strength they don't have the power. okay yes all those things are true but it's a little bit more complicated than that so um i know that so Al, did you have something, a question that you wanted to ask or chime in on? I see a, a note. From- uh, first of all, I wanted to thank all three of you uh, for this very important uh, uh, segment, probably one of the most important in terms of the age of civility and, and communication. And thank you for a great job in moderating. I, I wanted to ask uh, this one question, uh, which I think to me is the greatest challenge in the world of communications and, and media coverage of the political process, and that's the truth. Uh, we used to assume truth, uh, uh, at least people's honest versions of truth. We're living in an age where uh, lying is, is almost uh, taken as the norm or normal. And, uh, and how do we, you know, how how do you handle that in an era where also one of our biggest challenges communicating is that the people's growing attention deficit disorder because to disprove a lie usually takes more than a Twitter, uh, uh, you know, a, a Twitter message. And, uh, and covering that, you know, the, the news media or the printed news media uh, has enough ink to, to do a good job with it. But, in a Twitter world, in a social media world that we live in, how do you dispel something that's not true? How do you prove it's not true? And uh, how do you move forward, uh, you know, and, and, and still feel like you're being objective if, if you're in the media side of this? Al, that is such an important question. So important. And you saw over the last four years how toward, at the beginning of the Trump administration, reporters would do this false equivalency thing. Well, you know, uh, the Trump White House says this, but, you know, Democrats say that. And they just would not say what was true and what was not true. Mm-hmm. But by the end, really this last year, late in the year, what you started seeing reporters do was say, and that's not true. You know, he said this, but that's not true. And then proceed with their stories. And, and I think it was almost like a collective decision uh, by journalists across the spectrum to call out uh, falsehoods and lies and say what the truth is. And I think that commitment to truth, that is what journalism is supposed to be yes. about. And I hope that we are getting back on a better path uh, toward that end. Mm-hmm. And I'll say something else about that, because I think that when we talk about the Facebook and the social media filling the void of information, unfortunately, what's really contributed to this is the death of local news local newspapers, stringers from these mid-sized papers to Washington. Because, you know, I've, I, you know, my sister lives in Florida and she is not a political animal. She doesn't pay attention to this stuff. She's too busy. I mean, you know, and I can't tell you how many times I've said to her, 
well, she'll say, is this true? Something she's seen on Facebook. And I'll say, did you see that on the local news? Now, I, I wouldn't dare say, you know, NBC or not, you know, some national news outlet, because that's not, she doesn't, I'm not gonna say she doesn't trust it, but that's not her go-to source, right? So I'm like, did you see that on the local news? And she's like, no. And I said, well, then do you think it's true? And she's like, well, no, I don't think so. It'd probably be on the local news, right? People need local news, right? Yeah, they need totally. that. And I, and I, for one, and again, this is a problem that is, doesn't have a great solution because, you know, we know why local newspapers are dying. Um, and, and it's just, you know, and again, it's such a dilemma. Um, but I think that that's contributed to kind of where we are now is the, de the death of local news. Yeah. Yeah. Those, yeah, yeah. Those are great. Those are great points. I also add just because the social scientist and me and teacher and me just can't help, but even these co conversations. So we have these really great efforts to identify what's, you know, incorrect information. But that alone doesn't convince people, social scientists find, to change their point of view. They're not going to disregard it. But who they will listen to is friends and family. Mm -hmm. That's the hardest. <laughs> those are the hardest conversations to have. And those are the ones that we tend to avoid. But that's how you know politicians and we just engage each other in respectful and polite nudging ways where we're just asking, oh, I can, I understand that you feel that way. Can you tell me more about your feelings? Yeah. And right. just make them sort of you that's how you can come around to having a consensus building conversation of course that is a long long road right there's right. Sort of no magic bullet with that well you know and it's funny because when when facebook came around i remember trying to use it when i was when i would when i would you know consult with candidates or whomever organizations and i'd say you know that peer-to-peer -peer validation that you find on Facebook is so powerful. We got to harness it, you know, but somewhere along the way, we're not the rails. And, you know, like I said, we could have a whole other seminar about that. Right. Um, but that peer to peer validation is so powerful. And um, when you're, you know, it's, yeah. So it's just, it's like I said, that's a whole nother conversation. It's just where, when, when news or facts generate are generated from your place of comfort and what you consider home and you know self worth, that's that's so it's invaluable. So I'm going to get to some of the questions yeah. since we're getting low on time. So I'll throw this to you first, Jill. It's, and it sounds like we might have answered this a bit for Dylan. So regardless of the biases we see in news sources. Can you, can you imagine a practical remedy for this situation or is it just genie out of the bottle at this point? I don't think it's G, I don't think it has to be genie out of the bottle. Like I, I think that journalists need to commit to not doing this false equivalency set stuff. Just because a politician says something doesn't mean you just repeat it and then get someone else to respond. You, you have an obligation as a journalist to say if it's not true. Mm -hmm. um, and ob obviously I think that politicians have a responsibility to be truthful in their, uh, in, in their rhetoric. Uh, and you know we've just gone through a period where not only did our president not have a commitment to the truth, he really, um, you know, it was his whole MO uh, was to say anything uh, mm -hmm. in order to be provocative at all times. It, I'll throw this one to you, Christian. I'm going to kind of smush Elizabeth and William's questions together. So Elizabeth says that maybe we need a three-pronged approach, and I'm going to throw in Williams as a fourth. So she suggests that return of the fairness doctrine, uh, shame economic leverage, and or regulate the private sector, social media mega monster, and three, teach our children and youth and adults to be critical skeptics and judicious thinkers. And four, Williams suggests maybe term limits on politicians might be a useful way to combat some of this as well. What do you think, Christian? Well, you know, term limits is a great idea. I mean, you know, it's a great, it's a, in, in theory, yes. In theory, it's a great idea. It's just hard to enforce, and um, you know, and 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 that's a whole other conversation. But yes, I think that now that we know the damage that can be done, 
um, or that where we find ourselves now that we can start to teach our children to recognize misinformation at the least. So for example, I, as I just mentioned earlier, my children, because they've grown up on the internet, they've grown up on this, you know, kind of, um, you know, being kind of bombarded with this stuff all the time, they already are better at recognizing it. They're already better at processing it and, and, and then putting it in its proper place. Um, so I think it's a process that we have started that we need to kind of, and then, you know, to get experts together and, and folks that know what they're talking about and kind of reinforce these, um, these efforts to help people identify misinformation. Um, again, it has to be, you know, it can't be just a, one party or one group of people, you know, the elites, the whites, the, you know, it can't be any, it just, ha it has to be holistic. And again, that's a bunch of things, you know, embedded in what I just said. So, but yeah, I think we can start that now that we know the damage that can be done. Thank you. Uh, so Zachary, I'm gonna throw this question to you, Jill. He, he says, you mentioned that the media's profit motive for covering the political process divisively, but do you think politicians increasingly see a profit motive for governing, governing divisively? So they get book deals, TV hosting gigs, and so on. Uh, I'm not sure. It's a, I wouldn't describe it as a profit motive. I would describe it, I think their motivation is to lock down their supporters and, and add to that. So by being provocative, they get attention, mm -hmm. uh, they animate their supporters and they build their support. And it, I, I think has just gotten out of control. I will tell you, I am sitting in a house not very far from a place called Comet Pizza and the QAnon uh, people were all whipped up uh, talking about what was going on in the basement of Comet Pizza um, with Hillary Clinton. And this poor man, you know, drove up from, I want to say North Carolina, stormed into Comet Pizza one night with a rifle and, you know, passed all these families and their kids with eating pizza into the basement. And of course, there was no one there abusing little children in the basement. Uh, as he thought, as he had been learning on the internet. So, um, you know, it's, it's all gotten so out of control, culminating most recently with the January 6th insurrection on Capitol Hill. Do, do you have anything, Christian, that you might add to that? Because I mean, arguably, uh, at least we know that President, so, you know, former President Obama did, made all money on a book deal, right? Lots of ex-politicians make money in that way. Could, do you see that as a potential contributor? Well, I don't, I mean, I agree with Jill in the sense that I don't think that these folks go into politics with that, with that goal in mind. I do think that, you know, somewhere along the way they get a little, uh, what's the word, you know, just kind of intoxicated by the fame, intoxicated by the attention. Not all of them, but some of them. Um, but by and large, I don't think that's their motivation. Um, if, if the suggestion is that, that there should be laws on the books that, that politicians and or you know, elected officials cannot, take, cannot engage in those kind of things, um, and most of them don't until they're out of office, um, then you know, that's something to consider. Um, but uh, you know, nobody goes into politics to make money, I mean, seriously. Nobody goes into politics to make money. Um, it, you know, they just don't. And um, so most people, if, if what they're after is power and power is a very powerful currency. Um, so I think, I, I will say that there's probably, you know, a small percentage of politicians that get carried away. Okay, I think that's fair. But by and large, they're, most of them are in the, you know, on both sides of the aisle, they're in there for the right reasons. That's what I would say. Yeah. So I want to try to get to a couple more questions. So John, this one seems right up your alley, Jill. So what is the future of investigative journalism at the state and local level? 
given the dust spiral threatening so many daily papers? Who will mind the store, fact check public officials, root out corruption, et cetera? Wow, that's such a great question. I mean, I, as Christian was talking about local news earlier, I mean, say, investigative reporters, they could spend a year working on a story. They're a luxury. And, uh, you know, media companies that own newspapers or television stations, they're not investing in investigative reporters anymore. So, we're, you know, there are fewer and fewer around. They're at the big newspapers, the national newspapers, um, and maybe the television networks. But, you know, I think it's, um, it's not great because the truth is there's corruption at state capitals. You know, there's shenanigans um, that should be brought to light. And uh, if you do not have a, a strong free press at the state and local level, as well as the national level, you know, uh, everything's fair game. You don't know what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So Marion asks, when current events get too stressful, I've been advised not to watch the news. To what degree do you think media is contributing to the problems of the day? What do you think, Christian? Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I agree with her. I, I, there's days when I'm like, I don't want to watch the news. I don't want to look, you know, I don't even want to, you know, look at the, you know, post or uh, the Washington Post or the Times um for for obvious reasons but um you know it's important to kind of you know and again i'm i don't want to i don't want to say that it's important to stay informed however whatever that looks like to you uh and make sure you get the facts i i hear you i don't sometimes there was days recently that i didn't want to uh you know turn on the news or read a newspaper so yeah. i get that I, I hope those days largely are behind us, but yeah. But it's a rough time out there. And look, I, I, I go to Netflix, I'm watching, you know, I'm watching shows to get through this COVID period and also to tune out some of the harsh news. And I think it's a normal, natural yeah. thing. And, and I, I, think I, I like to read too. <laughs> right, and I think it's totally okay to do that too, right? Yeah, totally okay. <laughs> and so I'll end on our last question will be one from Fabian. He says, we've talked about how media companies need profits so they may embellish content and journalists need to generate views so they may insert opinions. But how can we curb the demand for misinformation? We've seen how if demand is present, the market will follow as exhibited by sites like Parler. Well, well look, I think that sunshine is always the best disinfectant. Mm -hmm. So when you see disinformation, it has to be called out. So for me, I rely on the reporters who write about the media. You know, if I see it, I take it to, um, to, the, to the media writers like Brian Stelter at CNN or Eric Wemple at the Washington Post. I mean, there are a number of reporters at the New York Times that is their sole job is to write about this. And I think it's really important that these things be labeled as such and that everybody knows because, you know, you got to name it and shame it. Mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, I agree. It's not, it's not something that we can fix right away. In fact, it's, it's a big problem that I think we're going to have to, I mean, it's going to take a lot, a while. It's going to take a while. Um, but we're just not identifying the real problems here. Um, you know, and I think it's a process, you know, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think you're, it's definitely true. It's certainly a process and we're in strange times. It's important for us all to remember that COVID is this big giant backdrop to all of our experiences, including how we read or choose to avoid the news right now. Mm -hmm. I'd like to thank both of you so much for giving your time for, to us this evening and sharing your experiences and points of views. And I thank all of you for coming and listening and participating in the conversation this, this evening. We are still working on rescheduling our event with Senators 
Mitt Romney and Senator Manchin. And we will get back to you as soon as we have information about that rescheduling. In the meantime, to make sure that you're up on our events, go to www.iopfsu.com. That's www.iopfsu.com. But thank you again. Have a good evening and be well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.